Hi! So up until this point we've been talking a lot about atoms and chemistry and catalysts etc but now we're finally ready to start discussing machine learning and how we can apply graph neural networks to the modeling of atoms. And just to be upfront with you all, you know, I have a bias towards catalysts and the Open Catalyst Project, so a lot of this video I'll be discussing, you know, how we actually apply these models specifically to catalysts, and also I'll be looking at models that we've been playing around with a little bit more as part of the Open Catalyst Project. But it's my hope that most of the video is general enough that even if you're not working on catalysts, but if you're working on, you know, large molecules or small molecules or something else, that this will still be useful for you. Uh, it'll help you understand how graph neural networks are applied to your problem. All right, so let's get started. So as a machine learning or AI researcher, the first thing we need to know about a problem is what are the inputs and what are the outputs? So the inputs to our problem are really simple. It's just a bunch of 3D atom positions and their atomic numbers. And the atomic numbers are, you know, is the atom copper, platinum, uh, iron, you know, etc. So specifically for catalysts, there are two sets of atoms. The first set of atoms are the atoms that are part of the actual catalyst itself. And the second set of atoms are the atoms that are part of the absorbate. And the absorbate, again, is just the molecule that is part of the chemical reaction. And here, and in a lot of po points in this talk, I'm going to be showing you basically 2D visualizations of the atoms. But just to give you a sense for what they look like in 3D, here are some illustrations of you know, different systems in 3D kind of rotating around. So as we discussed in the previous video on catalysts, what we're looking at here is just a unit cell of atoms. So a catalyst itself is actually a 2D surface, and what we do with the unit cell is we tile it in the x and y directions to then make basically a 2D surface that goes off into infinity. So if we look at the dimensionality of our inputs, for the positions of the atoms, we have each atom is going to be a three-dimensional um, x, y, z position, and it's going to be a real number. So the total number of positions is going to be three, to th three times n, where n is the number of atoms. And then the atomic numbers are going to be integers, typically ranging from 1 to 80, and there's going to be n of those as well. As outputs, we're going to be computing the energy of the overall structure and the 3D atom forces, where the energy is just a single real number for the entire structure, and the forces are going to be a three-dimensional force vector for every single atom. So there's 3n values overall. The way these structures are typically modeled is using something called a graph neural network. Each atom is represented using a node, and each edge corresponds to neighboring atoms. So how do we actually define the neighbors of an atom? Well, one of the easiest ways to do this is just find all neighboring atoms within a certain you know, cutoff distance. So for instance, here we have all the atoms that are within five angstroms of the atom uh, of interest. Now, this works in most cases, but there can be edge cases where this isn't ideal. For instance, if the absorbate's really far off the catalyst surface and you set a uh, cutoff at five angstroms, it's possible that the cutoff might be too small and never actually include any of the atoms of the catalyst. And then if you do this, you'll never actually see the attractive forces of the catalyst on the absorbate. Another possibility is we use a k closest neighbors. So this is just picking out k, let's say it's eight in this case, is going to be the eight closest neighbors or eight closest atoms to the atom of interest. And this allows us to kind of solve the problem we just looked at. So if an absorbate is too far away from the catalyst surface, you know, it's beyond five angstroms, it's still going to include in its neighbor list some of the atoms from the catalyst itself. A lot of times what we do is a combination of both of these. So the atoms have to be within a fairly large cutoff radius, let's say 10 or 12 angstroms, and we pick at most, let's say, the 20 closest neighbors. So another thing you need to consider when you're thinking about how do I construct a neighboring graph is periodic boundary conditions, or PBC. And when people talk about PBC, what they mean is that unit cell, which I was talking about, is repeated you know, over and over again um, in the x and y directions. So if you have an atom like this, and we just look at its neighbors, um, you can't just consider the atoms that are in its unit cell. You need to be consider the atoms which are in its neighboring unit cells as well, because those might also be within your cutoff radi radius or be you know, one of the k closest atoms. And if you're using the Open Catalyst repo, this will all be done for you automatically. You won't have to worry about it, uh, but it's just something to be aware of. All right, so let's talk about our graph neural network. So the graph neural network has one primary operation, which is you have an embedding for, let's say, your nodes, and this is for the simplest case in a graph neural network. And what you want to do is update those embeddings using messages from the neighboring nodes. So here the embeddings are x, and the message here is m. And we're just going to sum over those messages for all of the atoms that are part of your neighborhood. 
So the way we compute the energy and forces for a graph neural network is as follows. First, we initialize the network, typically by using the atomic numbers to look up an embedding. We then iteratively update the embeddings using the messages I just talked about. And then finally, we take the resulting embeddings and we pass that into another neural network to compute the energy of the overall system. So how do we compute the forces? Well, there's a couple different ways of computing the forces. The first is we can initialize it on a network, we do a bunch of rounds of message passing, and then we compute the energy. And then we compute the forces by taking the derivative of the energy with respect to the atom positions. And this will tell us the forces of the atoms. The problem is that this approach can be quite expensive, because we have to do a forward pass to compute the energy, and then we need to do a back prop through the entire network to compute the derivative of the energy with respect to the atom positions. So this can be computationally a bit expensive. And the other thing is that in practice, a lot of times with these graph neural networks, is when you do this back prop, it can, be, it can lead to basically instability in the neural network during training. So a lot of times we're not actually using this approach. So in practice, we're usually using a second approach in which we initialize the network, we do a bunch of rounds of message passing, as we did before, and then we compute the energy and the forces directly. So here we have one head which computes the energy and we have another head that computes the forces. What's nice about this is computationally much more efficient. No need for a backwards pass. Uh, we don't have to worry about numerical stability as much. So it's really nice in that regard. So just to repeat, we initialize our neural network. We iteratively update the embeddings using the messages. Then we compute the energies and forces using two different neural networks, uh, each as a head. Uh, the energy is computed per atom using Fe and then we sum over all the atoms to get the structure's energy, and then we have our forces, which we compute per atom. So one thing that's really important to understand about this approach that computes the forces directly is that it's not energy conserving. Energy conserving means that the total energy of an isolated system does not change. For example, if we had a closed system with two atoms, as the atoms move closer together, their potential energy decreases. This might seem to violate energy conservation, but what's really happening is that as the atoms move closer together, their velocity is increasing. And as the velocity increases, so does their kinetic energy. And as the potential energy decreases, the kinetic energy increases, and this perfectly offsets to conserve the overall energy of the system. Another way to look at energy conservation is to view a potential energy surface like the one shown here. And note that we're just showing a 2D surface, but in practice, a potential energy surface will be much higher dimensional. Energy conservation implies that if you sum or integrate the forces along a path that starts and ends at the same point, the forces should sum to zero. If you compute the forces as a derivative of the energy, this will just happen naturally. It's a mathematical property. But if we compute the forces separately from the energy, this property might not hold. And for some applications like molecular dynamics, this can actually be a problem. But for other applications like performing relaxations, this is less of an issue. That's it for this video. Next up, we're going to dive into different model architectures and representations that we use to model atoms.